This is the good, the bad, and the ugly of every main edition of Dungeons and Dragons. This is part two, so if you haven't watched part one, I'd encourage you to check it out. I'll put a link just above in the top right corner. If you joined us for the last one, welcome back. This episode, we're going to look at uh, third edition, fourth edition, and fifth edition. And in the last episode, we looked at original Dungeons and Dragons, first edition, and second edition. Put a comment below for what your favorite edition of D&D is, and also let me know if I've missed anything, if I've missed anything that you would actually add. And uh, without further ado, let's get into it. D&D 3rd edition was released in the year 2000. In 2003, they did a rules update to the books that you have in front of you. These are called 3.5. Much of the content between the two editions, or 3.0 and 3.5, is the same, but they just did a few updates to, you know, to change the game, streamline it, do a few, make certain classes a bit more powerful, and really just to integrate some of the community feedback uh, that was taking place at the time. So, what is the good of Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition? The first thing that was quite revolutionary at the time uh, was that the Open Gaming License, or OGL, was released alongside uh, D&D 3.0. This basically meant that third-party publishers could produce content for Dungeons & Dragons and they were able to sell it. This had actually not been um, legal, or this had not really been um, an approved thing before this, and the person that was mainly responsible for the open gaming license was uh, Ryan uh, Dancy, but suffice to say, it made quite a big impact on the gaming community and it really facilitated a lot of third party publishers to, to create some really, really cool content. Another really great thing about third edition was it streamlined a lot of rules uh, that for years had been sort of a bit clunky or um, maybe not as intuitive as they could be. The key ones that I'm thinking here are ascending armor class, um, saving throws, and formalize the process of skills and introduced a new concept uh, called feats, which were basically certain abilities that your character had that would enhance or um, augment their power. One thing that Dungeons & Dragons did to a greater extent than other editions was really sought the idea of balance. Now, this could be a good or, or not so good thing depending on your perspective, but what it did do is the design philosophy behind it was trying to ensure that there was a more sort of fair and more, I guess, equitable play experience for all people at the table. 3.5 is very popular for allowing player choice. And I'm going to say this is another great thing about 3.5. You could kind of play almost any sort of character you wanted. A huge variety of splat books or um, supplements were introduced, which allowed your character, and if you, you know, you were really into sort of rogues or, or scoundrels, as they put it here, there were, there were plenty of rules to make um, those better, and they, it was the same for fighters and any other kind of class that you could think of. Uh, they introduced things like the Expanded Psionics Handbook, which had almost a bunch of different classes in their own right, and just tons of rules for if you're running Psionics at the table. And really, there was sort of a choice or an option for everyone. The character that you can imagine could be created within this rule set. It also introduced uh, the D20 system, and so the, the idea behind this was that there was a unifying mechanic for almost everything that you would do in the game. This being the D20, the, you know, you roll the D20, add some modifiers, and compare it with the target number. And this was really something that, um, if you were coming from earlier editions, a lot of people did appreciate. There's kind of pros and cons to that. I think one of the benefits of those earlier systems was you got this more kind of asymmetrical experience, and sometimes that was really fun and enjoyable. The benefit, of course, with um, 3.5 is that you got this a more, um, you know, it was easier for people to pick up and there was this kind of a, a, a real sort of um, unity among the whole system. You, you sort of knew what to do and it was fairly intuitive because of that. Another thing, and this might be a little bit of a funny comment, but it still feels like D&D. &D. The first edition I ever played of um, Dungeons & Dragons was um, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition. And I was a little bit um, unsure when we picked this up originally, we were playing 3.0, but I was a little bit unsure about whether it was the same thing or not. You know, is, is I guess these are the right rules to buy. And I remember playing through it and just thinking how similar it actually felt to AD&D. &D. Yeah, sure, really, really different rules. 
but the spirit of it I felt was intact. It still felt like that Dungeons and Dragons experience where, you know, you're adventuring, you're creating a character, you're getting attached to that character, and you're just facing off against all of these really iconic monsters, which appear in this monster manual. The artwork's pretty good. There's this really nice kind of um, overarching graphic design to it, which I think still holds up. And the range of monsters in here, um, like the first edition monster manual, just cover a really wide gamut of um, iconic monsters um, for, for D&D. So you're pretty covered. And then later on, they published um, more uh, <laughs> monster manuals. Um, I think it goes up to monster manual five or six. Another really great thing about third edition was it actually had pretty good adventures. The Sunless Citadel was kind of a classic first level adventure to get people into the game. Uh, we had a lot of fun playing through the speaker in Dreams. Um, yeah, I have, I have very fond and vivid memories of this particular adventure. And then later on, um, in, as 3.5 was introduced, you get these kind of more sort of modular um, campaigns that could be run in sort of sections. You didn't have to run the whole thing and it, it offered kind of encounters, um, but then you could actually run the whole adventure almost as a uh, campaign. So you really got quite a variety of, you know, sort of quite traditional adventures on the one hand, and then you also got, um, you know, this is sort of approaching uh, fourth edition. This is published in 2007, and fourth edition comes out in 2008. But across that third edition run, you really get a good variety of adventures. Additionally, you got some really decent supplements, I think. This, this version of God and Realms campaign setting, to me, is really a good one. You know, it, it has a lot of information. It expanded um, on some of those earlier uh, earlier Forgotten Realms entries. And um, yeah, you know, it's it's fairly flavorful and I'm not a huge fan of Forgotten Realms, but you know, this, if you're looking for any version of Forgotten Realms, either this or the very original box set would, would have my vote. One other comment I'd like to make is, you know, the Dungeon and Dragon magazines that came out around this time, um, published by Paizo, who went on to create Pathfinder. They had some really good, it had some really good content in them, whether that was, you know, additional rules for D&D uh, &D, or whether it was adventures and um, a lot of the dr dungeon magazines had just quite awesome and quite creative uh, adventures in them. We played through a lot of those too. Now, what about the cons? Well, I said before that the player choice was good. I think one of the drawbacks of 3.5, if I'm being honest, is just that there is kind of too much material. Now take that with a grain of salt because you can actually just play, you know, with kind of the three core books, but inevitably players know there's those options and they're going to want to play some of that stuff. So as a DM, you have to be really vigilant about deciding what you do or don't include in a game. It's not necessarily a problem, but the game can be quite crunchy and especially at high levels where characters are dealing with um, having a high base attack and having multiple attacks each turn and dealing with spells like that are altering time, it can get quite complex. In a similar vein, it can be quite hard to prep if you're creating your own homebrew stuff. The stat blocks are often really enormous. So for example, let's take the Aladrin here. Um, it has a little bit of a write-up, not much actually, but just a little bit of a write-up there. It starts the stat block there, tells us how much hit, hit dice and hit points it has, how much initiative bonus, how, how fast it is, what its AC is. And then we've got all this other stuff too, like the base attack, grapple and attacks and full attacks and space and reach and special attacks and special qualities and saves. And if you compare that with a, you know, earlier editions of D&D, &D, this is really quite uh, a lot to, to wade through and especially a lot if you're trying to prep. To me, it generally feels with 3.5 that there's a bit of rules bloat. Another point that I want to make is just that the min-maxing sort of thing with players. In other words, they wanted to make the very best optimized uh, character. They wanted that character to be absolutely awesome, and they wanted it to be better than everyone else's. And this was the kind of game that if you did a lot of research and you poured through all of the supplements and the different rules and different kind of prestige classes and options for, for characters, you could create something that was pretty imbalanced for the game that you were playing in. 
Finally, the last point that I want to make is just around character creation. And sometimes with 3.5, this could just take quite a long time, especially if you were adding those additional rules. Um, you had to read, you know, the, the, the write-ups about each race. And I mean, look, this is at the entry for the dwarf. One and a half pages of text just for the dwarves. And then when you get into classes, you know, it's no better really. Like there's can it can be quite complicated, especially when you start um, having spell casters. That experience could be quite overwhelming, especially for new players or someone who just wants to create a character and get into the game and isn't too bothered about optimizing. It's 2008. Massively multiplayer online role-playing games are taking off. MMOs are taking off. Games like World of Warcraft are dominating. And I think Wizards of the Coast really got kind of caught up in that with this edition of the game, 4th edition. It's really easy and plain to see the influence of um, online gaming and the effect that that had on RPGs. After 3rd edition, this was has been kind of known as quite a hated <laughs> version of Dungeons & Dragons. What was really odd about this is you would think that by now this is all you need to play. You need a player's handbook, a Dungeon Master's Guide, and a Monster Manual. But no, you actually need this and this as well. This for me has actually been the hardest um, one to talk about. I want to be fair about it. I don't want to just unnecessarily um, kind of dump on this. I want to give some good reasons why it's good and some good reasons why it's not so good. Um, and often I found as I was putting these together that some of the good was actually a con as well. So sometimes there's a bit of crossover in what I talk about here. On the face of it, one of the really good things about D&D 4th edition is that it tries to make things equal for all players. There's a lot of consistency, there's a lot of equality here, a lot of the classes are quite balanced to one another, and really you get this internal system uh, that, that has kind of, you know, it wants things to be fair, it wants things to feel fun, and it wants things to be kind of balanced. Some of the monster design in D&D 4th edition is particularly good. By the time we get a bit later into the life cycle of 4th edition, you really start to see some, some really cool things with the monster design. And so here we have about four different versions of the same thing, the, the Fel Drake. And depending on what level or what sort of relative power this is, it gives us different rules for that. Um, it, it gives us kind of some DM AI that can be used to make the experience of fighting this um, creature a little bit more fair. And the stat blocks are definitely not as con you know not as long and not as dense as third edition, and it breaks it up really nicely into standard actions and move actions, and it gives you know like triggered actions. The other mechanic that it introduced, which was which was awesome, is the bloodied mechanic, and that's usually um, half the creature's hit points. When it becomes bloodied, it usually activates some kind of um, like a triggered response. And what this did was it created a lot of um, kind of rat like variability to the monsters that you would encounter. You might encounter a kobold, but that kobold, you never knew what to expect with that kobold because it, it could be, you know, just a stock standard kind of kobold. It could be have a it could be a kobold with a special ability. And that bloodied effect, you just never knew how it's going to, you know, impact the game as you start to take some of this monster's hit die down. What's going to happen as you reduce hit points? What new threat is going to emerge? And to me, that was just really good monster design. There was kind of, yeah, that AI element to it where rather than it just being a kind of a punching bag for the players to eventually just reduce its hit points, the monster, it felt like the monster had was more living and breathing and had a bit more autonomy to what it was doing. In 2010, they released um, the Essentials line, and um, they did really they did a lot to kind of clean up and simplify the experience for new players getting into the game. And the Essentials did consolidate and, and sort of streamline a lot of the existing rules. You get start getting products like um, this one, which we've kind of already gone over a little bit, and. Um, this, was, this came out in 2011, but it still fits into that sort of essentials line where they revamp the monsters. Another thing that 4th edition did was really um, put this, the, the attention on miniatures use. It really encouraged miniatures use, and in some ways that actually makes the table a lot more of a, a visceral and tangible experience. Another good thing about it is that it was very action-focused. 
Um, it really put the it really sort of played with the idea of action and, and different players having um, strengths and things that they could do and um, abilities and really these the characters from the outset are heroes and they you know they can go in and, and have actions that they complete just as just from the from the outset. There were really clear character paths that you could develop, and where 3.5 could go into a lot of different areas, 4th um, edition kind of created these paths that best suited your character. So it was quite a different um, sort of character design than, than what we were used to in the past. What is the bad and the ugly for Dungeons & Dragons 4th edition? One of the questions that I saw get thrown around a lot was, is this even D&D? &D? And for me, I didn't really get into this game at all for, for quite a long time, not, not until after 5th edition was released. And when I started getting into it, I had actually reframed it for myself and said, yeah, if I think about this as not D&D, it's actually a pretty cool game. And I'm not saying it's not Dungeons & Dragons, but I think if you think about what came before and even what's come afterwards, this was such a departure that I truly think it was hard for people to get their head around. There were quite a few innovations and things about it um, that were really appealing, um, but ultimately I just think it was just too different, and that really did throw some people off. The second thing is the adventures. While there were certainly some good adventures uh, in 4th edition, some of them were just really average. I don't really want to go on about that, but that is something to think about. Another bad thing about 4th edition, it's not unique to 4th edition, but I think we see this play out a lot more evidently with the release of 4th edition, was that fracturing of the fan base. Now, this happened every time a new edition of D&D was released, but with 4th edition, it was particularly evident because we see players go from being diehard Dungeons & Dragons fans to moving over to Pathfinder 1E. When Pathfinder comes out, a lot of the players that are playing 3rd edition switch over to Pathfinder because that that, to them is more D&D than 4th edition. The effect of this is that there was not a lot of consolidation or there wasn't a real sense of kind of in some ways community or there wasn't a single-mindedness around D&D at the time. It felt like people, there was like the edition wars and people are kind of going off at each other online and it was just generally unpleasant. The thing I always say about this is like if you like Dungeons and Dragons, we're kind of, we have more in common than not, you know, and just enjoy I would be happy to sit down and play pretty much every edition of D&D, &D, and I think that was something that really got lost during the fourth edition time. People just kind of were hating on each other in the edition just for the sake of it, and you really saw that fracturing of the fan base take place at this point in time. I talked about earlier the fact that the miniature use could be quite good in adding this sort of um, this visceral kind of tangible... Um, you know, physicality to the game. But by the same token, this system was just assumed and almost demanded that you use miniatures. And sometimes you just want to play a game and you just want to be it to be your imagination. Sometimes you don't want to pull out a, a whole horde of miniatures. You just want to enjoy it. And sometimes I think the use of miniatures can be limiting to the imagination. Another thing 4th edition did was just released a lot of kind of powers. And so the way that the classes worked in 4th edition was that uh, they all had powers. And so each, rather than having like that traditional kind of supplement, the supplements for 4th edition were around powers. And this one here is for barbarians, druids, shamans, and wardens. And um, yeah, you just had a lot of these types of books. You had all of the other players' handbooks. It got could get quite confusing. And then another thing was there was a real, there was much more emphasis, in my opinion, on magic items. And so um, you almost needed dedicated books or ideas for magic items because, again, it was this assumption that heroes are powerful and that um, they they kind of needed magic items. By the time it was 2014, Wizards of the Coast decided that a new edition of D&D was in order. Fourth edition hadn't performed particularly well compared with its predecessor, and after six short years, players were then faced with the reality of needing to fork out for another set of core rulebooks. Fifth edition is the current edition of D&D, and I'm sure everyone at this stage that's watching is familiar with this edition. 5th edition really popularized D&D, and I mean really firmly, firmly entrenched it in popular culture. You've seen D&D in television shows like Stranger Things, um, there's a movie that came out 
called Dungeons and Dragons and Critical Role and even games like Baldur's Gate 3 have all acted to popularize this edition of D&D. Arguably, there's more players than ever before. There's a sense within popular culture that this is really a behemoth of an edition. And I think we'll look back on this edition as kind of paving the way for that. Another good thing about 5th edition is it honestly tried to get back to its roots. It had strayed quite far from that in 4th edition, and as I said, some of that was innovation and some of that was just going in a different direction. And so 5th edition really made a concerted effort to reel some of that back and say, what is it about D&D that makes it D&D? And I remember as they were designing it, those were the sorts of questions that they just kept coming back to. What makes D&D D&D and really kind of respecting the roots of the game while keeping some of the innovations that were made in 3rd and 4th edition? Another difference or a good thing about 5th um, edition was there was a slower release of content. 3rd uh, edition certainly released a ton of, of books. 2nd edition was notoriously uh, bloated. And even 4th edition, to an extent, had quite a few books. And so there's a real... Um, at the time, Wizards did make a commitment to, to slow the releases down of supplements. By now, in 2023, we're seeing um, there is quite a plethora of books and options and stuff, but it's, I don't think it's as much as some of the previous editions that, we have, um, that we've seen. It's fairly inviting to new players and it is colorful and there's a real attempt to kind of create a bit of diversity while still giving players options. Players can make multiple choices while sort of sitting within a relatively simple framework. By now, there are also a lot of resources that you can use to, to help your game. One of the things that D&D 5e has done is gone back to its roots with a lot of published adventures while also making new content. Um, in Tomb of Annihilation, for instance, you, you get some of those classic adventures that first appeared in first edition, and you see that with the ghost, you know, the Salt Marsh campaign and, and so forth. Um, you know, got dwellers of the Forbidden City, and just some of this, some of the attempts here are just to kind of almost throw back to the past while doing that in sort of a fresh way. And then with Out of the Abyss, adventures like this, it's kind of a new thing, but it's still playing on, on tropes that we've experienced before, you know, the Underdark and exploring, having a whole campaign based around that, that Underdark experience. Now, some people have kind of debated the quality of 5th edition adventures, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But, um, you know, there are options, and some of them are actually pretty good. On top of that, because it's the most recent edition of the game, it kind of receives the most support. And so you have something like Tolis, which was um, as Monte, Monte Cook's book. He was one of the designers in 3E, but this came out ugh, in, in uh, the 2000 era, and he's re-released this for 5th edition. So the 5th edition gets a lot of support. There's a lot of um, pretty good third-party stuff. One of the things that is potentially a downside about this is while it kind of takes an inspiration from some of those earlier editions, it kind of almost lacks its own personality. There's just something about it where it doesn't feel as quirky or individual or unique as some of the things that have come before it. I mean, even 4th edition, love it or hate it, had a real strong feel to it. It had its own thing going, and it was fairly unapologetic in the way it did this, whereas I feel like 5th edition is kind of amalgamating and trying to please everyone. Some of the releases with 5th edition feel really, like, for want of a better word, kind of half assed I did a review on Spelljammer, and while I didn't take a really good read of the rules, just it just left me feeling a little bit dissatisfied. The artwork is amazing. You know, you get these really great visual artists, but it just, it's lacking something. I don't know whether it's just the nostalgia for me, and maybe if it is, I need to be a little bit more open-minded about it. I genuinely try to do that, but time and time again, I just feel like the content is just a little bit bland and a little bit like they've phoned it in. The corporate overlords of Hasbro are definitely felt in this edition. There's kind of, it feels a little bit cynical. It feels like you're the product, you're just being given a product rather than um, something that's truly been produced out of love and inspiration. My mind kind of is is drawn to some of the OGL debacle where they tried to revoke the open gaming license and then when they were called out for it, they really backtracked. And just things like that that just kind of put a bit of a damper on the community feel and the goodwill that could exist and should exist for this edition of the game. As I said, it's brought people together, unlike other editions of D&D, 
I think most people would probably be okay to play this edition. Um, but, you know, it's the opportunity is kind of lost because there's this real kind of really heavy handed uh, corporate thing going on. And it just, it feel, you can feel the impact of that bottom dollar, that the, the attempt to get money from, from this. I understand it even like I, it's a company and it needs to make money and it needs to be profitable. But that feeling, that sentiment gets in the way of the enjoyment of the actual product. And you feel that in the product. Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition feels very safe. Like it's all the kind of the edges are being shaved off and it's this very rounded and smooth thing, but it's lost a lot of its uh, vitality and, and the things that make it unique in the process. There's an attempt to make it inclusive and diverse for everyone, but I can't help but feel it just, it's, it's, they're trying to do that because it's popular, not because it's authentic. And I think there are ways that you could, you know, really include the fan, fandom and, and really truly be authentic in an approach to be diverse and to, to include people and to make, make people feel safe. But a lot of it just feels like they're blowing a trumpet and calling attention to it and kind of saying, hey, look how inclusive we are when it doesn't, it doesn't feel authentic. Again, it just feels like kind of a corporate nod to inclusivity. And again, it kind of weirdly gets in the way of the, what makes an edition unique and what makes it creative and what even makes it dangerous. To me, fifth edi edition doesn't feel dangerous. It's fine. It's a fine edition, but it doesn't feel dangerous. It doesn't have a huge amount of character. And ultimately, it just feels a little bit bland because of their attempts to please everyone. I feel like I might have been a little bit harsh with 5th edition, and, and maybe I have been. I want to kind of reiterate that it is a really popular edition. Mechanically, it's actually really good. Um, and I think if, if you're just wanting to play some edition, like play some D&D &D and try it out and just do it with some friends, this is a great edition. So we come to the end of the series. We've explored original Dungeons and Dragons in 1974 and we've gone all the way to the present with fifth edition this video series has really been about trying to build some awareness around the different editions of DD. &D. it's not saying this edition is better than another it's not saying you should play this and this one sucks my intention has to it has been to be tried to be fair and balanced about every edition to really look at some of the strengths and the weaknesses to kind of help people make a decision for themselves my hope is that as part of this video series, you are kind of contemplating checking out or re-examining another edition of D&D. Maybe you've never played D&D before, and in watching these videos, you now have an idea of which edition of D&D you might like to pick up. Thank you for sticking around for this journey, and uh, see you in one of my next videos.